from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm going to introduce Alex Ross. Uh, Alex has been the music critic of The New Yorker since 1996. His first book, The Rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century, won a National Book Critics Circle Award and the Guardian First Book Award, and was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He has also published an essay collection, Listen to This, and is now working on a third book, Wagnerism, Art in the Shadow of Music. And please welcome Alex Ross. Uh, thanks so much, Nick, and thank you uh, all for uh, coming out on this uh, lovely afternoon uh, for a Wagner uh, discussion. Uh, it's such a great honor to be uh, invited to speak in this auditorium, uh, where as a native of Washington, D.C., I attended a number of concerts uh, at a quite young age. Uh, once I was a teenager, uh, I timidly ventured into the great main reading room uh, where kind librarians uh, humored uh, curious research projects that I was uh, undertaking in school, including one year an inexplicable inquiry into the uh, standing stones and chambered tombs of the highlands and islands of Scotland. Uh, and of course, the Library of Congress on Music Division served as a base when I was researching my first book, uh, The Rest is Noise. I spent many happy hours in the Copeland and Gershwin papers. Uh, like so many, I owe multiple and unpayable debts to this great institution. Today's lecture stems from uh, this slowly gestating project, uh, which uh, Nick mentioned, uh, a study of Wagner's influence uh, on literature and the arts over the past century and a half. The subject is a familiar one, yet I believe there is still uh, new territory to be explored. In researching the book, which is still in its uh, early stages, uh, I've come to realize that Wagner's impact on the modern world is even more extensive and all per pervasive than I had suspected, and not always in the expected spheres. Uh, at the beginning of the year, at the Wagner Worldwide Conference at the University of South Carolina, I delivered a lecture entitled Black Wagner on African American Wagnerism, and I was delighted when the Library of Congress expressed interest in having me speak on the same topic in the context of this Wagner in America program. The phrase Black Wagner contains an obvious tension or contradiction. For if the man or woman in the street knows one fact about Wagner these days, it is that he was a racist. Indeed, uh, Wagner's credentials as one of the foremost, loudest racists of the 19th century are secure, even if the precise nature of his racism and the degree to which it may permeate his output remain a matter of debate. In later years, Wagner subscribed to the view propounded most influentially in Artur de Gobineau's essay on the inequality of the human races, that the so-called Aryan peoples were the highest of races, that when they mixed with so-called lower races, they underwent degeneration, and that black people were allegedly the lowest of all. Yet racism is not a monolithic phenomenon. One might speak of a constellation of locally rooted hatreds to which the pseudo-scientific language of Gobineau and others gave a universalizing veneer. Notably, Gobineau pays relatively little attention to the Jews. And when he does, he calls them a free, strong, and intelligent people, one that fell prey to miscegenation. For Wagner, the Jews were, of course, an overriding obsession. Despite bursts of grudging admiration, he came to see them in the notorious phrase that Goebbels made into a Nazi slogan as the plastic demon of the downfall of mankind. 
Black people, on the other hand, caused Gobineau to shudder with disgust, while Wagner manifested at times a more ambivalent reaction. I would like to begin by exploring Wagner's own attitudes toward people of color before moving on to the topic of African-American attitudes toward Wagner's work, giving particular attention to W.E.B. Du Bois, whom you see behind me. In her diaries of 1882, Cosima Wagner, the composer's second wife, recorded a conversation between Wagner and Gobineau, in which they trade derogatory remarks about die Neger, as she calls them, quote, also about the attitude of the superior to the inferior races, the Negroes, for instance, are, Ricard, says, the greatest triumph for the intellectually superior person is to win the love and devotion of those beneath him, whereupon the Count, Gobineau, says such love can be found among Negroes, but not mulattoes, unquote. Elsewhere, Wagner uses Negro or mulatto as a metaphor for dim-wittedness, such, I assume, is the import of his perplexing description of Tristan und Isolde as, quote, my first Italian opera for an audience of mulattoes, unquote. In other entries of the diaries, though, Wagner exhibits tremors of sympathy. In March 1882, he seems to be criticizing Thomas Carlyle for his violently racist 1849 pamphlet, Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question, quote, this is Cosmo's diaries again, R expresses his surprise over his, Carlyle's, taking sides against the Negroes, saying how rarely a person is completely free. He feels that deism, the Jewish kind, which inhibited even Goethe, also oppressed Carlyle's spirit, unquote. And this is a tortured perspective indeed, Carlyle's racism seen through the lens of Wagner's anti-Semitism. In the 1881 tract, Herodom and Christianity, Wagner states that a, quote, partaking of the blood of Jesus might raise the very lowest races to the purity of gods, unquote. Whatever that might mean, and however it might come about, the inequality of the human races is not in Wagner's mind, absolutely fixed. Most curious is Wagner's admiration for Quechuayo, king of Zululand, who humiliated English forces in the early stages of the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879 and then went into exile. In March of 1879, Cosima records, Wagner saw a picture of Quechuayo, or Quetawayo, uh, as she calls him, and looked with pleasure on, quote, his finery and his melancholy face. He also talks about the military organization of the Zulus and says one can almost find in them the raw beginnings of the Lycurgian constitution, unquote. When in June 1879, Prince Napoleon was killed in the Anglo-Zulu conflict, the son of Napoleon III, uh, he had joined the British army after the imperial family fled to Kent, as I'm sure everyone knows. <laughs> Wagner sees divine retribution at work. Quote, fate takes a solemn view. Zulus are also human beings like ourselves. And he, the prince, dies not gloriously, but surprised fleeing, unquote. Here, Wagner is obviously ventilating his familiar hatred of the French. In an aside, he blames the prince's mother for having started the Franco-Prussian War. Still, the phrase human beings like ourselves is striking, if only he had seized upon that sentiment more often. At the end of 1879, reading Ernst von Weber's account of his African journeys, Wagner casts doubt on the entire idea of civilizing non-Western peoples. Quote, then he says with a laugh that he would like Ketawayo for company, unquote. The image of an insurgent underdog seems to stir the old rebel spirit in Wagner. But I won't make too much of these anecdotes. They add up to the usual Wagnerian mishmash of attitudes without deeper ideological implications. 
For Germans of Wagner's generation, in advance of the brutal colonial drive of the 1880s and 90s, black people were remote, unthreatening curiosities. In mid-19th century Europe, among the most famous black figures was the African-American tragedian Ira Aldrich. He was most famous for his Othello, but he also drew notice for his boundary-shattering ventures into white roles such as Macbeth, Richard III, Shylock, and King Lear. Wagner almost certainly saw him perform at least once. A native New Yorker who subsequently moved to England, Aldridge was successful in the provinces but was never able to establish himself on the principal London stages. His Covent Garden debut as Othello in 1833 aroused bitter opposition in some quarters of the London press, racism being an obvious factor. Aldridge did, however, win enormous fame on the continent in the early 1850s and later in the decade in Russia. Théophile Gautier, seeing him in St. Petersburg, acclaimed his Othello as sage, controlled, classical, majestic, and judged his King Lear even finer. I couldn't find a picture of him as Lear, but here is one of him as Shylock. The high and the mighty thronged to Aldridge's performances. In 1853, King Friedrich Wilhelm IV of Prussia gave him a gold medal for art and science and Emperor Franz Josef honored him as well. During a subsequent tour, Aldridge performed Othello in Zurich on November 18th, 1857. This is an image of Aldridge as Othello from around this time. Wagner was then living in Zurich, having been driven into exile after the revolutions of 1848 and 1849. Gottfried Keller and Georg Herweg two of Wagner's Zurich associates uh, are known to have been in attendance at this Aldrich performance. Herweg, the radical poet who introduced Wagner to Schopenhauer, wrote of, the, uh, wrote of the performance in highly admiring terms. Everything thought through, everything calculated, all understanding, all art. Wagner, who had recently thrown himself into composing Tristan, at least planned to go, as we know from his letters to Matilda Wesendonck, quote, Wednesday, Othello, Ira Aldrich, tickets to be booked in a timely fashion. Something about the peremptory nature of this note suggests that Aldrich was already a familiar topic of conversation in the Wagner circle. Indeed, Liszt had written to Wagner of Aldrich in 1853, saying that the actor, quote, plays beautifully Othello, Macbeth, and Fiesco. In the period of the Harlem Renaissance, the possible Aldridge-Wagner connection did not go unnoticed. Both James Weldon Johnson in Black Manhattan and Langston Hughes in his children's book, Famous American Negroes, made mention of it. Wagner's probable attendance at a performance by Ira Aldridge does not in itself tell us very much. It does, however, lead into a fascinating detour one that introduces a certain complexity into our picture of racial attitudes in the Wagner household. In the past couple of years, I have been researching the almost entirely forgotten career of Aldridge's daughter, Lorana, who was scheduled to sing as one of the Valkyries at the Bayreuth Festival of 1896. I'll present a quick summary of my findings here. You can read more about the entire Aldrich clan in an article I wrote for the New Yorker last summer. Ira Aldrich fathered at least six children with two women. His second wife was Amanda von Brandt, a supposed Swedish baroness who had studied singing with one of Jenny Lynn's tutors. Three of their children displayed musical gifts. Ira Frederick, who showed marked ability as a pianist, composer, and conductor, and came to a lamentable end at the age of 24, flinging himself out of a window in a state of terminal delirium. There was Amanda, who studied with Jenny Lind herself, and based in London, went on to have a long and fascinatingly varied career as a singer, composer, and teacher, giving instruction to Roland Hayes, Marianne Anderson, and Paul Robeson, among others. Here is a 1952 article about her. 
and Lorana, who in the 1890s seemed on the verge of a major career until health problems curtailed her appearances. Most of what I've been able to discover about her comes from Amanda Aldridge's papers, which are held at the Charles Deering McCormick Special Library of Collections at Northwestern University. There's also crucial information in a 1958 biography of Ira Aldridge by Herbert Marshall and Mildred Stock, who were able to interview Amanda at length. In a family bedeviled by illness and early death, Amanda lived almost to her 90th birthday, dying in March of 1956. Marshall and Stock say of Lorana, presumably on Amanda's authority, she was a strong-willed, dominating, and pleasure-loving woman and led a full, active, and gay life. She never married. A French critic reported that she gave the impression of, quote, vigorous masculinity, end quote. Born in 1860, educated at a convent school in Gaunt, she later pursued vocal studies in London, Berlin, and Paris. In 1891, a critic in Hamburg praised her strong, dark-colored, quite well-developed voice, although he did worry about her vibrato. Critics always have to have something to say. <laughs> Charles Gounod had no such reservations recommending her enthusiastically to Augustus Harris, impresario of the Theatre Royal at Covent Garden. Voulez-vous entendre une des plus belles voix qui existent? Le voulez-vous? Eh bien, accordez une audition à Mademoiselle Lorana Aldridge, one of the most beautiful voices that exist. Not surprisingly, Harris hired Lorana at once. She participated in Harris's grand Wagner orchestral concert at St. James Hall in July 1893, singing Schmerzen from the Wesendonk leader, which Margaret Lattimore will sing for us shortly, uh, and also the lullaby Schlaf Holdest Kind. The same year, Lorana appeared as the Valkyrie Grimgerda in Valkyrie at the Theatre Royal, which in a previous incarnation had seen her father's Othello. In 1898, she returned as Schwertleiter, another of the Valkyries, and in 1905, she sang Grimgerda again in two complete ring cycles in London. At some point, it seems, she also sang Erda in the ring, for in the Amanda Aldrich papers can be found a photograph of the celebrated Russian-born soprano Felia Litvin in the role of Brunhilde, and it is addressed, ah, mon Erda, to my Erda. Where they might have sung together, I've not been able to discover. How Lorana came to the attention of Cosma Wagner uh, is also not yet known. I consulted archivists at Bayreuth on a recent visit there, the great Wagner archive, but so far no mention of her has come to light. Several Paris publications reported as early as January 1896 that Madame Wagner had engaged Lorana for the festival of the coming summer. Furthermore, Lorana established a cordial friendship with Eva Wagner, Richard and Cosima's second child. For in the Northwestern collection, there is a stiff piece of cardboard with a picture of the Feshbiel House at Bayreuth on the front and a message from Eva on the back. To dear Miss Aldrich, with many thanks and best wishes enjoying to see her again, kindest regards from my mother and yours truly, Eva Wagner, Bayreuth. Uh, I believe the date is uh, the 2nd of January, 1896. My guess is that early that winter, Lorana traveled to Bayreuth, auditioned for Cosima, and struck up a friendship with Eva. Marshall and Stock, in their Aldridge biography, give no specifics, but they do say that Lorana, quote, lived in Richard Wagner's home and became a close friend of his daughter, Eva. Lorana was back in Paris that same month on January 17th. She gave a recital at Salle Playel. Then it would appear she went back to Bayreuth in the spring, presumably for rehearsals for that summer's festival. This was the momentous occasion of the first Bayreuth ring cycle since the inaugural festival of 1876. Sometime that spring, however, Lorana fell ill 
The other item of correspondence from Ava at Northwestern is a note dated May 30th and addressed to the Hotel Kurhaus in Ruprechtstegen, some 45 kilometers south of Bayreuth. Here's a picture uh, of this place and uh, a later ad. Uh, the hotel evidently enjoyed heyday at the turn of the century, numbering among its visitors, visitors Cosima Wagner and her family. Rooms cost five to six marks a night, quite a bit in those days. Most likely, Cosima sent Lerwana there to recover from an unnamed illness and paid the bill. Eva writes, Dear Miss Aldridge, Mama and I were happy to get good news from you and we hope that every day will be a progress. Mama spoke immediately to Mr. Von Gross, who surely, meanwhile, will have fulfilled your wish. What say the spirits to the haunted chamber? Here is every day the same, work and again work. Auf gutes Wiedersehen and best love from all in Wanfried, Eva Wagner. This bears out Marshall and Stock's claim that Lorana and Eva had become close. They have some sort of in-joke going about a haunted chamber not been able to decipher it. There's the fact that Adolf von Gross, financial master of Bayreuth in the Cosima era, was summoned to address some need of Lorana's, possibly monetary. And in the reference to von Fried, the Wagner family home, there is the implication that Lorana knew the house well. Perhaps Lorana was still hoping to make it back to Bayreuth. Friedrich Wills, practical handbook for festival visitors, published just in advance of the festival, listed her as a participant, and as with other performers, supplied a paragraph description. Uh, it's helpful to know uh, before I read a translation that Ira Aldrich uh, had presented himself or allowed himself to be presented as African-born, supposedly the son of an exiled Senegalese prince. This was, in fact, a colorful fabrication. Aldrich's father, like Aldrich himself was a New York native, as uh, the biography by Berndt Linfors has established. Anyway, here's the text. A name that may well ring strangely in the ears of even the most observant art lovers is that of Lorana Aldridge, who will sing one of the eight Valkyries. Of Lorana Aldridge, one cannot say that she did not come from far off as she hails from Africa. She is the daughter of the African tragedian Ira Aldridge and studied singing in Germany, England, and France, and has appeared with great success in operas and concerts outside of Germany. She is praised as the possessor of a true contralto voice with a wide range. In the course of the festival, there will be an opportunity to put these statements to the test. Her fellow Valkyries at that summer's festival would have included Olive Fremstad, who also sang the first Norn and Floss Hilda. She would have performed before an audience that included George Bernard Shaw, Gabriel Fauré, Gustav Mahler, Alfred Courteau, Serge Diaghilev, Adolphe Appia, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Romain Roland, Colette, and Albert Schweitzer. But alas, she did not sing, as the Bayreuth archives confirmed. In May of the following year, Lorana, having recovered from this unnamed illness, apparently felt well enough to resume singing, and she inquired about the possibility of returning to Bayreuth. She received the following note in reply, and I was very excited indeed uh, when I first glimpsed this document in the Northwestern Archive. It was marked Eva Wagner, but as I think you'll quickly perceive, it has been mislabeled. Fabulous stationery to begin with there. My dear Miss Aldrich, I am very sorry indeed to be obliged to tell you that our personnel is complete and that it is now too late to invite you to take a part in our performances. I am very sorry about it. But I was very glad to hear that you are well again and that you can use your fine voice. Only I would advise you to go to a good master in order to learn how to manage this fine voice and not to destroy it before time. <laughs> 
I should have been very glad to have seen you again, dear Miss Aldridge, I assure you. And with best wishes for you, my children and I send you kindest regards. C. Wagner, May 24th, 1897. Cosima Wagner's command of English was excellent. Remarkable, said Lady Georgiana Byrne-Jones upon meeting her in 1877. And so the correct, if slightly peculiar, diction of this letter is almost certainly her own, although uh, it is not, it turns out, uh, her handwriting. This is, as far as I can tell, the end of the relations between Lorana Aldridge and the Wagner family. The remainder of the story is very sad. Lorana continued to give frequent recitals in London until the First World War, her programs ranging from leader to chansons to parlor songs by her sister Amanda. On one program, in what could be considered a pointed juxtaposition, she placed Wagner's Schmerzen next to her sister's three African dances. But I can find no evidence of a performance later than 1914. Rheumatoid arthritis restricted Lorana's movements, and by the 1920s, she was bedridden. Amanda devoted much energy to taking care of her. When, in 1921, W.E.B. Du Bois invited Amanda to attend the second Pan-African Congress in London, she answered, as you know, my sister is very helpless. I cannot leave for more than a few minutes at a time. Several of Amanda's distinguished students got to know Lorana as well as they stopped by the Bedford Gardens home where the sisters lived for lessons and advice. Kindest regards to your sister, Marian Anderson writes in 1929. I can't help thinking from the critical descriptions that Lorana's voice might have resembled Marian Anderson's in timbre. Incidentally, the composer Frank Bridge lived next door. The Aldridges might have seen young Benjamin Britten, Bridges' star pupil, darting in and out. Lorana's condition became increasingly unbearable. On November 20th, 1932, she committed suicide by taking an overdose of aspirin. She was 72. She was buried in a public section of Gunnersbury Cemetery in London. On a visit there earlier this year, I looked for her grave, but uh, the headstone seen in this older picture has vanished. She lies, according to the map provided by the cemetery, cemetery uh, somewhere in the foreground of this picture. The fate of Eva Wagner, Lorana's former friend, was no less grim in a different way. In 1908, past the age of 40, she made the fateful decision to marry the racist philosopher Houston Stewart Chamberlain. A Bayreuth pilgrim since 1882, Chamberlain had long been seeking a personal entree into the Wagner family. He settled on Eva, who promptly idolized him and embraced his ideas. She was present on that grim occasion in October 1923 when Adolf Hitler first visited von Fried and received Chamberlain's blessing. When she died in 1942, her coffin was draped in a Nazi flag and Hitler sent a wreath. I can't help thinking what conversations might have taken place at Bayreuth around this singer of mixed race. When she was there, Chamberlain was planning his 1899 book, The Foundations of the 19th Century, which attempts to tell the story of Western civilization as the triumph of the Teutonic peoples. In early 1896, Cosima Wagner responded to an outline of Chamberlain's book, which was destined to become a huge bestseller both in Germany and abroad. She made a string of comments, one of which is this. The Negroes surprised me, but I am entirely prepared to be convinced. She seems to be reacting to Chamberlain's statement in his outline that the Aryan peoples faced a struggle for existence with the Chinese and the Negroes, the latter being, quote, considerably more dangerous, unquote, than the former. The presence of Lorana in the household at this very time may have led 
Kozma to question, at least momentarily, an aspect of Chamberlain's thesis. I also wonder what might have happened if Lorana had actually sung at Bayreuth in 1896. Would there have been a scandal, as there was in 1961, when Grace Bumbry became the first African American to perform in Bayreuth? Here she is in Tannhäuser. Even at that late date, racist protests appeared in right-wing papers, and some mainstream journalists were scarcely more enlightened. One declared that Bumbry's skin color destroyed the illusion, as if there was any consensus about what Venus actually looks like. <laughs> this controversy erupted months before Bumbry reached the stage. In 1896, by contrast, the casting of a mixed-race singer as a Valkyrie caused no evident unease. Friedrich Wild, in his practical handbook, sounds bemused and perhaps a touch skeptical about the prospect of an African Valkyrie, but hardly outraged. This is not to suggest that Cosima's Bayreuth was somehow an enlightened place. But the episode of Lorana Aldridge points up the unpredictable dynamics of racism, and in particular the terrible intensification of racial animus, both against black people and against Jews, as the 19th century gave way to the 20th. That acceleration, which had much to do with the spread of pseudoscientific theories of race and with the rapid propagation of sensational rumors in the media, took hold in Bayreuth as it did in so many other places witnessed the progression from Chamberlain's The Foundations of the 19th Century, uh, which actually makes a point of decrying, quote, the perfectly ridiculous and revolting tendency to make the Jew the general scapegoat for all the vices of our time, unquote, to the unremittingly venomous writings of Chamberlain's last years. The Bayreuth of 1896 is not yet completely given over to the fulfillment of the Aryan mystery. It is no bastion of enlightenment, nor is it a closed world. It is, for the time being, a festival of the music of Richard Wagner, who still seems to speak for all. There's no evidence whatsoever of what Lorana Aldridge thought of Wagner, although it is safe to surmise that she felt a particular connection to the composer, or at least to his music. But other figures of the period give some inkling of what Wagner might have signified to men and women of African descent at the turn of the last century. Some surprising names appear in the admittedly short list of African-American Wagnerites. Langston Hughes, in an autobiographical note for the Saturday Review of Literature in 1940, wrote the following. I like Tristan, Goat's Milk, Short novels, lyric poems, heat, simple folk, boats, and bullfights. <laughs> I dislike Aida, parsnips, long novels, narrative poems, cold, pretentious folk, buses, and bridge. I guess we know where he comes down on the silly Verdi Wagner war. Hughes uh, once went to Venice in the company of the African American philosopher Alan Locke who knew Venice like a book, as Hughes later recalled, and who took him to see the Palazzo Giustiniani, where Wagner worked on Tristan, and the Palazzo Vandermeen, where he died. As Arnold Rampersad reveals in his biography of Hughes, Locke was actually hoping to seduce Hughes in the course of this Venetian Wagnerian adventure. He does not seem to have succeeded. There are scattered mentions of Wagner in the writing of County Cullen, who married Du Bois's daughter, Yolande. Ralph Ellison studied composition in his youth and had a particular admiration for Wagner. It has been proposed that Ellison's masterpiece, Invisible Man, follows a Wagnerian leitmotif system. Even Martin Luther King, a confirmed bel canto fan, had an ear for Wagner. In his Easter sermon of 1957, King maintained that only in church can one feel the presence of the divine, but admitted that certain forms of aesthetic experience provide spiritual intimations. For example, looking at the beauty of the sunset, gazing at the stars, or listening to a Wagnerian opera or a Beethoven symphony. But by far the most important name is that of W.E.B. Du Bois whom I've already mentioned as an acquaintance of Amanda Aldridge. 
that Du Bois, a towering figure in African-American political and intellectual history, widely considered the chief architect of the modern civil rights movement, took an interest in Wagner may come as a surprise to some, but Du Bois had long displayed a strong love for German thought and culture. His commencement address at Fisk University praised Bismarck for having made a nation out of bickering peoples. At Harvard, he read Kant with George Santayana. From 1892 to 1894, he studied political economy at the Friedrich Wilhelm University in Berlin. During that German sojourn, Du Bois immersed himself in concerts and operas, pondered Tannhäuser in the shadow of the Wartburg, and made the acquaintance of the operas of the Ring. He always recalled his early Berlin years as a time of personal liberation. For the first time in his life, he felt on equal footing with those around him, in contrast to his childhood in America. Much later, he said, I had a very, very interesting time. I began to realize that white people were human. In his autobiography, he pointedly noted that the year 1892, when he left for Germany, marked the high tide of lynching in the United States, 161 killings, the most in the nation's history. Du Bois emerged from his long and brilliant intellectual apprenticeship with a philosophy that Kwame Antony Appia has defined as cosmopolitan nationalism. It is devoted on the one hand to the development of a Negro consciousness and determined on the other to open that consciousness to the outside world, to sustain conversations across national and racial borders, to avoid what Du Bois calls group imprisonment. This philosophy seems to owe something to the thinking of Johann Gottfried Herder, who encouraged each national group to nurture its folkish heritage while also promoting a tolerant comity of peoples. In his Letters for the Advancement of Humanity, Herder condemned outright not only the practice of slavery, but the very idea of ranking ethnic groups. And in the astonishing poetic sequence called Negro Idols, he assumed the perspective of enslaved Africans and spoke of the specter of the vice teufel, the white devil. Du Bois and other African American intellectuals of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, early 20th centuries, might have assumed that such progressive ideas were more prevalent in Germany than they really were. With a few imaginative leaps, they might even have located them in Wagner's operas. Du Bois's 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk, that remarkable polyphonic blend of history, sociology, memoir, and fiction is the most complete statement of Du Bois' early worldview. The cosmopolitan nationalist spirit is evident simply in the way each chapter begins. A notation of an African-American spiritual is set alongside a citation from world literature, whether Arthur Simons, Byron, Swinburne, or Schiller in German. Of particular interest in this context is the penultimate chapter, the story of the coming of John. At the outset, we see paired together lines from Elizabeth Barrett Browning's A Romance of the Ganges, a ballad of a betrayed Hindu girl who throws herself into the ever-flowing river, and the spiritual, I'll hear the trumpet sound. You may bury me in the east, you may bury me in the west, but I'll hear that trumpet sound in the morning. This spiritual is the voice of exile, Du Bois says in his following chapter on the sorrow songs, his name for the spirituals. Of the coming of John is a tale of black humiliation and rage, an antecedent to Richard Wright's native son and Ellison's invisible man. John Jones, a young man with aspirations toward self-improvement and the improvement of his race, leaves Georgia to study at a black school in a place called Johnstown. He shows, quote, bubbling good nature and genuine satisfaction with the world. Back home, his family and friends anticipate his triumphant return. When John comes, they keep saying, the white judge of the town also has a son named John, 
the two boys are playmates when young. The white John goes to Princeton, and his family, too, anticipates his homecoming. Quote, Thus, in the faraway southern village, the world lay waiting, half-consciously, the coming of two young men, and dreamed in an inarticulate way of new things that would be done and new thoughts that all would think, unquote. John Jones struggles at first with school discipline and then applies himself more seriously. With education comes, however, an uncomfortable awareness. He grew slowly to feel, almost for the first time, the veil that lay between him and the white world. The motif of the veil recurs throughout the souls of black folk, serving as a metaphor for the ubiquitous presence of racism. One summer, John goes to New York with a vocal quartet and buys a $5 ticket for an orchestral concert in what seems to be Carnegie Hall. He finds himself seated next to a young white man and woman whom he does not at first recognize. He sat in a half maze, minding the scene about him, the delicate beauty of the hall, the faint perfume, the moving myriad of men, the rich clothing and low hum of talking seemed all a part of a world so different from his, so strangely more beautiful than anything he had known, that he sat in dreamland and started when, after a hush, rose high and clear the music of Lohengrin's swan. turning the page to the final chapter, you find that the scheme of pairing spirituals with literary, often European texts, has been set aside. At the end, the songs tell all, words and music bound together. This story has a singular place in the annals of literary Wagnerism. Few engagements with the composer are so highly charged. For decades, scholars have been trying to tease out the possible parallels between Lohengrin the Swan Knight, and John Jones. For the scholar Russell Berman, both are tales of incommensurability, of figures separated from the mainstream of humanity by an impenetrable veil. Despite the tragic outcomes of both narratives, the possibility of an egalitarian society still shines forth, even as it recedes, a grail deferred. Sieglinde Lemke offers a similar interpretation in the Cambridge Companion to Du Bois. Quote, Lohengrin's tragic separation from his lover reconfirms the incompatibility of the mortal and the immortal spheres. John's tragic end reconfirms the incompatibility of the racial spheres. Both heroes suffer from a dual identity, a double consciousness, as Du Bois called it. And Lemke plausibly explains the peculiar violence of the ending, atypical of Du Bois's merely wrist outlook. A devotee of intellectual commerce among the races is summoning the frightening alternative, the nightmare of a life without trust. Of the coming of John is Du Bois's most startling commentary on Wagner, but it is not the only one. There is an extraordinary epilogue some decades later when Du Bois made his way to Bayreuth. That the experience had a special meaning for him is evidenced in the fact that he saved his tickets, as many Bayreuth pogroms tend to do. Here is one for the complete cycle of the ring, and here is the other for Lohengrin. You may, however, be a little dumbfounded to see the date, 1936. What was the great civil rights leader doing in Nazi Germany in 1936? Some of his colleagues puzzled over this very question at the time. He was traveling on a grant from the Oberländer Trust, his stated intention being to study industrial education, but he also wished to assess how German culture had changed since his student days, quote, from the point of view of one not only outside the nation, but outside the Nordic race, unquote. He reported on his travels in weekly columns for the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the leading African-American newspapers of the day, in one of these, he makes a remarkable claim. As in the 1890s, traveling in Germany gave him a feeling of liberation. He writes, 
I have not suffered from race prejudice. I have complete civic freedom and public courtesy, unquote. He was, of course, not unaware of the forces at work around him. German anti-Semitism, he wrote, surpasses in vindictive cruelty and public insult anything I've ever seen, and I have seen much. All the same, the fact that he felt less open prejudice in Hitler's Germany than in Roosevelt's America is a devastating commentary on race, race relations in this country at the time. African Americans traveling in Germany made similar observations as late as the 1950s. As Kenneth Barkin observes, General Colin Powell recalls experiencing a breath of freedom when he served in West Germany as a young soldier. Black GIs could, quote, go where they wanted, eat where they wanted, and date whom they wanted, unquote. Two of Du Bois's columns dwelled on Bayreuth. He is well attuned to the contradictions of the place. He notes the high ticket prices, the presence of obnoxious wealth. Yet, he says, Wagner's works rise above such petty materialism. Indeed, they militate against the idea that clothes and show and extravagance spell life. He registers the incursion of racist rhetoric and takes note of the house near Von Fried, where Houston Stuart Chamberlain had lived. Eva Wagner Chamberlain, Lorana Aldridge's former friend, was still living there at the time in 1936. I assume they did not meet. But Du Bois is determined to draw positive lessons from Wagner of benefit to African Americans. In a column entitled Opera and the Negro Problem, he imagines a reader who asks, now just what has Bayreuth and opera got to do with starving Negro farm tenants in Arkansas or black college graduates searching New York for a job? He answers that Wagner's life was a persistent struggle in pursuit of an ideal from which black America had much to learn. Of the ring, he writes, quote, it is as though someone of us chose out of the wealth of African folklore a body of poetic material and with music seen in action, retold for mankind the suffering and triumphs and defeats of a people." Unquote. Like many non-German Wagnerians of his period, Du Bois imagined applying the mythic method of the Ring and the other operas to one's own native context. But his favorite of the operas is still Lohengrin. I've heard it six or eight times under many circumstances in different languages and lands. It is a hymn of faith, Something in this world man must trust. Not everything, but something. One cannot live and doubt everybody and everything. Somewhere in this world, and not beyond it, there is trust, and somehow trust leads to joy. Du Bois's attempted appropriation of Wagner as an emblem of cosmopolitan racial pride did not catch on, to say the least. White Americans beholden to the racial philosophies that were sweeping Europe had other uses for the composer. A little over a decade after the publication of The Souls of Black Folk, D.W. Griffith's hugely popular film, The Birth of a Nation, would use the ride of the Valkyries, the Rienzi overture, and variations on Wagnerian motifs to lend a heroic aura to the racist horde of the Ku Klux Klan, hooded riders save a southern town from black rule and rescue a captive white woman named Elsie, no less, at which point Wagner gives way to the strains of Dixie. Then in the 30s and 40s, as most of America recoiled from Hitler's Germany, Wagner acquired increasingly ominous associations as a long list of cinematic citations would attest. And in Apocalypse Now, Francis Ford Coppola turned Griffith's imagery upside down, staging an American helicopter assault on a Viet Cong village to the tune of The Ride of the Valkyries. Colonel Kilgore, the half-mad officer in charge of the operation, says, it, Wagner, scares the hell out of the slopes. The underlying calculus is that racism and Wagner go together. Wagner is purveyor of bombast, Wagner is aggressor, Wagner is avatar of racial hatred and prophet of Hitler. These are now standard images in the popular mind. What is instructive about turn of the century Wagnerism is that it allows us to experience the operas through the eyes and ears of those who did not know what was coming, 
who saw in them possibilities that may now seem improbable or even delusional. I think not only of John Jones glimpsing paradise through the veil of Lohengrin, but also of the prairie elder in Willa Cather's story of Wagner matinee, who at a Wagner concert in Boston finds herself coming back to life, transported by Siegfried's funeral march to a world where hope has lain down with hope and dream with dream and renouncing slept. Or Theodor Herzl, listening to Tannhäuser and imagining a Jewish state. Or the socialist leader Jean Jaurès, revering Wagner's sensitivity to all life, to its every tremor and its infinite traits. Granted, Hitler underwent a similar epiphany when he first encountered Wagner in Linz. He would soon join a lineage of nationalist anti-Semitic Wagnerians that goes right back to the source. While the tracing of that racist lineage has been a necessary scholarly undertaking in recent decades, countering a conspiracy of silence or obfuscation among Wagnerians, it may have inadvertently marginalized alternative approaches to Wagner, Jewish, African-American, feminist, leftist, and so on. In some quarters, the Nazi framing of Wagner has come to be seen as the true, the correct understanding of Wagner. In my estimation, this grants Hitler a troubling posthumous victory. Let me return in closing to that strange scene of Du Bois and Bayreuth. Modern readers may be puzzled by the fact that Du Bois gives so much attention to Wagner in his columns reporting from the festival and from Germany, and so little to one of the great civil rights stories of that period, Jesse Owens's triumph at the Berlin Olympics. Du Bois might have been expected to celebrate that feat. He was, however, suspicious of the cult of sports and preferred to focus on achievements in science and art. Gazing at mementos of Wagner in a display case, he imagines a young black artist who will one day mesmerize the world with comparable genius. He imagines, in other words, a black Wagner, a sorcerer of myth. His conclusion is as emphatic as it is startling. The musical dramas of Wagner tell of human life as he lived it, and no human being, white or black, can afford not to know them if he would know life. Reading such sentences, we may feel that far from being done with Wagner, we may have only just begun to understand him. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.